Um, I'm Elliot Higgins, I'm the founder of Bellingcat. Um, I'm just gonna start off by explaining some of the basics of what we do with Bellingcat. Um, we have a process um, which we can break down to three stages of identify, verify, and then amplify. So identify could be any kind of thing from uh, finding an interesting tweet about something you wanna look into or proactively searching for information that you wanna investigate. You then verify it, and there's a whole different number of ways we can do that, and I'll be talking about that uh, more shortly, and then amplifying that information. Once we actually have the information, what can we do with it? We can turn it into reports, we can turn it into data sets, we can turn it into art projects. Um, there's a whole wide uh, variety of things we can do once we've verified that information. So one of the most basic techniques we use is something called geolocation. So I'm gonna take you through a quick example uh, of what geolocation is. So this is an example from TG in Libya in 2011, where uh, Libyan rebels claimed they had captured a town. Um, this was the first town they had captured in quite a while, and there were claims that this was untrue. So how do we know where this video was filmed? Um, well, what we do is we start by narrowing down the possible locations it could be. They're claiming it's TG, so we're gonna start looking in TG. But what are we looking for in TG? Well, for one thing in the video, there's this uh, very distinct mosque. It's got a minaret, it's got a large dome. Um, there's also, we can see it's next to a road. There's two lanes of traffic, there's a divider between it, um, and it's certainly wide enough to fit a large tank. So we can go to satellite imagery of the town in question on Google Earth, and uh, straight away we can see the road running through the middle of it, so that's our first possible place to look. We can see there's two lanes of traffic, we can see the, how wide the cars are as well, and we can follow that road along until we come to a mosque with a dome and a minaret. And this is similar to what we can see in the video, but that just narrows down the possible location it could be. So we wanna start looking at smaller and smaller details. So we start looking at, for example, the curve in the road and the discoloration between the uh, road surface on one side and the other. We see there's a wall there. We can look at even smaller details. We can see the shadows being cast by uh, service pylons and poles. We can see trees, the shapes of building, how they relate to each other. And by looking at all those different elements, we can be absolutely sure where that video was filmed. Um, to give an example of how we use that in a crowdsourcing sense, we're using our community. Um, there was a social media campaign a few years ago by ISIS, and they encouraged their followers on Telegram to post photographs of themselves holding pieces of paper with a hashtag written on it, uh, saying where they were in Europe. And the idea was that ISIS supporters were everywhere in Europe, and they wanted a big kind of media recognition for this and kind of this campaign of fear. Um, I looked at these photographs and I realized that while uh, the first one is definitely impossible to geolocate, if you can geolocate that, I will hire you. Um, the second one um, is done inside a shop. Obviously, the shelves will change over time, so that's going to be extremely difficult, if not impossible. But the third one, it actually isn't that difficult to do. Um, we have various details that are visible. We can see a bus, so we can tell it's almost certainly on the bus route. It's claimed to be a monster in Germany. So if they're telling the truth, it might make our life a bit easier. Um, but when these were published, I, I basically have a large following on Twitter who are really into open source investigation and trying this out themselves. Uh, it's like their hobby, it's like the Sudoku they do, do every evening. Um, so I basically shared this and someone said, well, um, you can see an advertising poll there. And there's actually a website in Germany um, which lists all the advertising locations in Germany. So you can search for Munster and you can in fact select advertising polls and it will show you all the advertising poll locations in Munster. And what's quite useful about this is um, the map imagery you have for Munster is this lovely high resolution aerial imagery. It's not like the usual satellite imagery you get, so you get lots of interesting details. And from that, it's possible to find the location in question. And again, how are we sure it's the location in question? Well, the camera is positioned over here. We can see the advertising pole quite clearly, obviously. But behind that, we can see the uh, railings. We can see the road markings, and we can also see the road markings are in the correct position as well. We can see the uh, uh, lights over the road and the lights on the other side of the road, and lots of other details that allow us to be exactly sure where this photograph was taken. Um, and this is one of four photographs from this selection that were geolocatable like this. And because we asked people on the internet, well, I asked simply on Twitter, the community of people who follow our work, um, out of those four photographs, three of them, the exact location was found within 10 minutes. And out of one of those photographs, the person who took the photograph actually lied about their location, but it was still discoverable within an hour. So by using crowdsourcing, we can find this information. Um, the thing is, this is a kind of investigation where uh, we have clues in the image that leads, leads us to a location. And there's um, another project that has been done 
uh, recently by Europol called Trace an Object, Stop Child Abuse. And it's a campaign they've done with the public where they've asked public to identify objects they've taken out of abuse imagery. So this is a very serious topic. Um, and the, what they're trying to find out is where these photographs were taken. They have no other information about these photographs, and they're hoping the objects can be used to find it. Now, at Bellingcat, we saw this campaign, and we started um, using a platform called Check, where uh, you can actually do systematic verification by using, the, using a community to examine each object step by step. And by doing that and engaging with a community, um, we were able to actually identify many of these objects. I think um, after one year, out of about 100 objects, I'd identified about 80% of these objects, just from these small fragments and using this community. Um, one of the most uh, strongest examples we have is this photograph. This is a rare one because they show the entire photograph in this image. But this could be any hotel anywhere in the world. And very, very quickly, a businessman said he had been to the same hotel and the website had a photograph of one of the rooms that, apart from the bed sheets and a little bit of decoration, is exactly the same hotel room. So, um, and this is in Mauritius. So it's a pretty obscure location for most people, but this, because this one person saw that photograph and we could crowdsource his answer, we were able to find the location. Um, in this other case study, a BBC journalist, um, who's, uh, who's actually someone we had trained a little earlier, he had come across um, a, a colleague who had, um, his family uh, had moved to the British Virgin Islands. Uh, I think it was his sister and uh, their family. And they had moved there just before Hurricane Irma was hitting. And they had shared this video. And this was the last thing they had shared, and then they vanished for two days. And this was taken from their new home. The problem is um, they didn't know where the new home was. And they had lost contact with their family members, and they wanted to know where they were because the hurricane had hit the islands and they didn't know. So we don't really have that much in this video, as you can see. It's a short video, um, and it doesn't show too much, but it does actually show enough. So for example, we can see these islands in the background. Now, they have a certain shape to them, a kind of a fingerprint. And um, you can actually use Google Earth to search through terrain. And what we have here, we can zoom in to part of the British Virgin Islands, and if we place the camera on the ground in Google Earth, you can actually see the terrain. And in the distance, you see a row of islands. And those islands are the same shape as the ones that are visible. But that's not good enough. A digital image isn't good enough. So we use a platform called EchoSec. And EchoSec allows you to search for geotagged photographs and images from social networks. And it just happens someone going down that road had used Flickr, geotagged a photograph they'd taken there of those islands. And I was able to download a lovely high resolution version of it and we can compare this to what's visible in the image. And you can see that kind of, although it's distant and it's hard to see, you can see that kind of shape is the same. So that helps us narrow down the potential locations, but that doesn't tell us exactly where it was taken. It's a wide area that that photograph could have been taken from. So we start looking for other clues. So what's interesting here is you can see the top of the roof. It's got these uh, wooden overhang that's visible. You can also see a railing as well. And that doesn't give us too much information for now, but we have to start narrowing down where this could be. So we, we know they're a family, they're probably in a new home, so this is probably the railings on a new home. So we go back to the area we're looking at. And this is the area in question. There's three possible locations it could be. So the first location is here. It's Pocklewood uh, Park, I think, or Pond, and it's an industrial area, so it couldn't be there. Here you would see the boats in the foreground when you, on the video, so it's likely gonna be in this area, which is an area of residential homes, and how do we know this? Where we can see swim pools, cars parked in driveways. So where can we find images of these houses? Well, there's not many geotagged photographs, there's nothing on Google Street View, um, so I started looking up uh, local estate agents and Airbnbs, and it turned out a lot of these houses have been sold recently, and one of the houses I found was this one. And by looking at, through the photographs that were posted online, I could start seeing matches. So you can see the railing is very similar. And this was significant because all the houses in that area that I saw had different railings. And they had different styles. They were all architecturally unique from what I could see. And there was another image. And we can actually see here from the same house, the same style of roof. But the problem was, when I was looking through all the photographs, none of them actually matched with what I was seeing in the video. So I looked at the estate agent's image, and then I did a zoom in and had a look at these houses. So the house on the left-hand side is the one uh, that was in that advert. And what I noticed is the house just to the right of it 
is identical. Apart from the additional swimming pool, the design of the house on the top at least looks the same, apart from the color. And it turns out, um, when we phoned up the estate agents, he had just sold the house to a family from Britain who had just moved in and been evacuated. And it was the same family that had gone missing. And using that video, we were able to get their family in contact back with their family um, in home. Um, so another example is when we looked into white nationalists in Charlottesville. So um, there was this very well-known photograph of a group of men attacking uh, an, a teenager. And we wanted to identify who these people were. So um, there was a whole community of people looking into this, um, and they still do, actually. Um, so some of these people are identified, but we were looking at this one person in particular. So what we did, first of all, is we went through social media, YouTube, every single source we could find of videos and photographs of the event. And we found this image. Um, and this shows uh, a guy, he's wearing the same kind of plate shirt. Although the stickers on the helmet are unclear, you can see it's a kind of customized helmet. The colors and the shapes are in the right location. So it's highly probable it's the same person. Uh, so you can see the shirt. Um, and we managed to find some other images of him as well. Um, so this is another photograph of him, but how do we know it's him? Well, we start looking at details. Um, one thing you should always do when you're trying to match two faces together is look for marks that are unique. So in this case, he has these uh, moles of birthmarks all over his neck, and they're in exactly the same pattern. So you can be sure this is the same per person, but there's other little details as well. You can see this, uh, his ear shape's the same. He's also got a um, chain around his neck as well that's the same. So we can be sure this is the same person in the photographs. But that doesn't tell us who he is. That just tells us it's the same person. So what we do is, if we don't know who he is, we look at his digital community. So we start looking at the people around him. Who are these people? If you're going to go to a kind of Nazi march, are you going to go with your friends? That's the question we're asking. So um, fortunately for us, um, someone else had already identified those two people. And we could see from the uh, photographs they were used, they had social media profiles. So we took those social media profiles and we looked them up. Now, the first guy was this guy, Jacob Dix. He uh, had lots of photographs, so he was easy to uh, identify using his photographs. Another guy was Ryan Martin. He had very distinct neck tattoos, aside from everything else, so that was easy. Um, the problem is Ryan had his friends list closed, so we couldn't see who, who his friends were. But Jacob didn't have his friends list closed, and we could see he was friends with Ryan. So we started searching through his friends list to see if he was friends with anyone else who was interesting. And eventually we came across this guy, Daniel Do uh, Ballin, as he called himself, um, and he had a public friends list, and we could see he was friends with Jacob, and he was also friends with Ryan, and we could see in the photographs he had on, his, uh, on the site that he was clearly the same person uh, as we could see here, and we can see the same marks on his necks again. So uh, using this, by exploring his digital community, we were able to identify who he actually was. Um, so by you piecing all these clues together, we were able to get a name. So he was it, who was he? He was Daniel Balden, and this is what he looked like before, and this is what he looks like now uh, waiting for sentencing after being arrested for attacking that person. Um, so that's the work of Bellingcat. Um, thank you very much.